Oh, thanks a lot for coming. It's uh, fantastic to uh, have you here. Uh, I will uh, talk about sublinear algorithms. Mm. And uh, unlike Michael's, uh, no, Michael's, Martin's talk, uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, will not be an attempt at uh, a fair and comprehensive overview of what the area is about. Uh, it will be an extremely biased sample of uh, questions that I like a lot and uh, that we have recently been able to resolve. And I love them, and I think that a lot of uh, other exciting research can come out of them, so I'll tell you about them. Good. So what are sublinear algorithms about, and uh, why do we care? Uh, in general, uh, it is a fact of life that uh, the amount of data that humanity generates has been growing at a very steady pace over the past um, uh, past few years, and about a decade, and this graph presented on the slide shows that this trend uh, really is not uh, slowing down. You can think of the number of Google search queries uh, issued every second, uh, tweets, internet traffic, and whatnot. So the sizes of the data sets that we have to process are undoubtedly growing, and we need to know how to process them. Well, what exactly process means. Let's see what kind of things we want to compute on uh, our data sets, which I claim become very large. For example, a lot of data that we get today uh, comes in the form of graphs, let's say social networks, and we like to analyze them to analyze the, how society operates. Here's a classical example uh, of social network analysis from 1977. This is known as Zachary's Karate Club um, result. Uh, if you haven't seen it, do Google it. And basically, this is about uh, an analysis of a breakup of a karate club into two uh, factions. And uh, this is one of the first uses of graph theory in social network analysis. And it turns out that this social structure broke up uh, exactly along a minimum cut in the social graph. OK, so when uh, Zachary had to analyze this network in 77, uh, the only thing he had to do is uh, run some max flow min cut computation, something that we teach in undergrad courses, and in particular in this uh, room sometimes, on this, this network here. And it contains 78 edges. It is not too hard to do this. Just about any algorithm will uh, succeed. OK, well, imagine doing this on a uh, social network that is of interest uh, today, or at least was of uh, interest a few uh, uh, a few years ago, presumably continues to be that way, uh, say the Facebook network, you realize that it contains a lot of edges and a lot of nodes. So it is very challenging to even fit this graph into the memory of a single machine, let alone perform non-trivial algorithmic uh, analysis on this, uh, on this network. Good. Uh, another example uh, of big data that we algorithmic challenges and big data analysis that we come in contact with every day is uh, online advertisement. For example, here is a snapshot of uh, my uh, computer screen uh, several years ago when I was looking for flights from New York to Geneva. Okay, so I look for New York to Geneva flights and uh, I get some information and in particular a lot of ads. All right, so what exactly happens behind the scenes at this moment? Well, what happens behind the scenes at this moment is that Google solves a massive bipartite matching problem. So uh, the problem here is the following. Imagine a bipartite graph that connects advertisers. Uh, here they are at the bottom. These are airline companies selling flights, in particular from New York to Geneva, uh, to potential queries that people can issue on Google. Examples include, say, Geneva to Paris or New York to Geneva. Good. So, for example, Swiss flies from Geneva to Paris and from New York to Geneva, so it's interested in both queries. And United uh, does not do Geneva to Paris. Great. So this is a bipartite graph, and it's actually annotated with frequencies of certain queries appearing, say, over a period of a month on uh, Google.com, uh, and on the advertiser side with the budgets. How many times do the advertisers want to have their ads shown to the relevant, uh, in response to the relevant uh, queries? Uh, good. So a very basic question that Google needs to answer about this graph is whether or not, given the current statistics on the type of queries that they receive, they can serve the advertising contracts. Okay? So this is a question of testing whether a massive graph contains a large matching. And the graph is massive because, as you imagine, the number of queries and advertisers is immense. 
Well, given these two examples, you might think that the big data phenomenon somehow is uh, confined to the realm of discrete graph uh, questions, but of course that is not the case. You could imagine uh, questions in high resolution medical imaging, such as uh, NMR or MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, where we would like to reconstruct very precise images of the human body from uh, the measurements that we take using the corresponding physical machines. If one looks at the mathematical underpinnings of this, one realizes that this is the problem of reconstructing functions from Fourier measurements. So this is a, a very much a continuous um, uh, reconstruction problem uh, that we need to solve on extremely large data sets because we take a lot of measurements and want high precision reconstructions. So we would like to design very efficient algorithms for processing large data sets. All right, good. So we would like to design these algorithms, uh, but we should ask the question of, well, perhaps we have them already. So let's see what classical theory of algorithms tells us about efficiency. Uh, something that we teach in algorithms courses is that the classical gold standard of efficiency is the notion of nearly linear time computation. For example, uh, classical instances include sorting. If we, we, can, we sort n numbers, as long as we can uh, load them into the memory of our machine in n log n time. And this is truly efficient, we never hesitate to sort. Another classical example is the Fourier transform problem. Uh, given a vector of length n, loaded in the memory of your computer, compute the Fourier transform of this vector. We can do this in n log n time using the fast Fourier transform, FFT, and this is truly efficient. Again, we never hesitate to run these computations. On the other hand, if you think of today's data sets, um, the situation changes. Think of sorting a petabyte of data. That's something that you can't conveniently store in your computer, so it's a whole different challenge. Or perhaps you would like to find the top 1,000 largest Fourier coefficients of a length 100 million vector. So think of this uh, reconstruction problem in medical imaging. Or perhaps you're doing social network analysis. You want to count the number of triangles in some massive graphs. Triangle counts are related to the clustering coefficient, a very important uh, signature of uh, social networks. Okay. So here, for these computations, instead of doing them in linear time, we would like to design some very clever sampling scheme that will only look at a small subset of the data and figure out the answer faster than even looking at the entire data set. So sublinear algorithms are exactly this class of algorithms that process inputs of length n uh, in time or space or samples or using resources significantly smaller than the size of the input. So we go beyond the classical gold standard in uh, efficiency. OK, so I will give you, as I promised, a highly biased overview of some directions that I find very exciting uh, in this area. But uh, in general, sublinear algorithms are a very old and diverse field. Arguably, they were started in the 90s by uh, classical works on estimating basic stream statistics. This was with applications to estimating internet uh, traffic going through routers. Um, this was about estimating basic statistics of uh, data streams. And these techniques have already very much found their way into the practice of uh, computing on big data. There are uh, other uh, areas uh, of interest include property testing. So this is when uh, we're given some very large input and we want to approximate some property of it by probing in a few locations and never really looking at the entire input. Uh, randomized techniques from sublinear algorithms have found their way into numerical linear algebra, and revolutionized the way we think of uh, solving linear regression and uh, uh, related questions on big data now, uh, on big data. And of course, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, data that we get uh, come in the form of graphs, so we're interested in uh, designing uh, graph analysis primitives. So subgraph counting, if you think of social network analysis, uh, performing random walks, think of recommendation systems, if, uh, getting a sense of proximity between nodes in the graph. We want fast primitives for all of this. Good. Uh, well, as I said, sublinear algorithms are a, an extremely broad field, and in fact, it uh, in overlaps significantly with questions that are traditionally more signal processing or numerical analysis. So say this 
uh, aforementioned uh, sparse Fourier transform problem. Given a very large vector, figure out the largest Fourier coefficients in it uh, faster than FFT. Good. So what we do in our lab is design a theory of sublinear algorithms uh, that will answer these challenges and form the foundation of big data analysis. Our focus on these two is on these two areas. So I'll just uh, talk uh, mostly about processing massive graphs and these more continuous sparse Fourier transform related questions. Good. Okay. So uh, first, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, space efficient graph processing. So this is known as graph streaming. Okay. So first, what is this streaming model of computation? In a streaming model of computation, we think of the algorithm as ingesting a very long stream of data items. Now, data items at this point could be just about anything. Could be tweets, IP packets, search queries, whatnot. Okay? Now, as the algorithm is ingesting the stream of data, item, uh, data items, its task is to maintain a small space summary of the stream so far. And from this summary, it should be able to approximate various stream statistics. Okay. Here's an example. The distinct elements uh, problem, a classical example. Again, going back to my search history from a few years ago when I was looking for flights uh, to Geneva, or perhaps I look for flights uh, to Geneva, then I get tired of this process. I uh, go for a coffee, and then I get back to looking for flights in, from New York to Geneva again. So there are three queries here. In the distinct elements problem, uh, the question is, observe a stream of queries, say queries over Google, uh, on google.com over a period of time, and approximately compute the number of distinct queries. Okay. So here the answer is two, because one of the queries is repeated twice. Okay. Great. So how can we solve this uh, in the context of very large streams, like queries on google.com over, say, an hour? A very basic solution would be just store the entire stream, use some kind of a hash table, and count the, the answer, compute the, the answer exactly. But that is prohibitively expensive. We cannot store such streams. Um, the distinct element sketch known as hyperlog log, which is widely used in uh, practice these days, allows us to approximately compute the answer using space exponentially smaller than the size of the actual stream. So formally polylogarithmic in the size of the stream. So these are the uh, types of solution that, solutions that we want. Instead of storing the entire stream, just store a few numbers. Good. Um, good. Now, in graph streams, the situation is, a, is a somewhat different. So suppose that uh, we're processing a large social network. So we're given a graph as input. Uh, there are n vertices. Here they are, the green uh, dots on the slide, and uh, up to n squared edges. So our algorithm ingests a stream like this. So the edges come in and, uh, say, takes a single pass over the stream and then needs to output the answer it's at the end of the stream. Good. OK. Of course, uh, in reality, what is uh, happening is that you know, the, this picture here on the slide is a little misleading because it looks like you know the, you know the input. Uh, in reality, what happens is that some, you start with a zero configuration of memory. That's your initial memory state. Then some edge arrives, you update your memory, you forget the edge, then some other edge arrives, et cetera, et cetera. Good. Good. So usually in graph streaming uh, algorithms, we assume that the algorithm cannot store all the edges, but can store all the vertices of the graph. This has been the classical assumption in the field. Uh, and uh, there are some good reasons for that. One has to do this uh, for many problems. However, in, uh, a few years ago, we were able to show that, for example, one can approximate matching size in a massive graph. Think of this uh, online advertisement example uh, using just polylogarithmic amount of space. Uh, so this is essentially storing just a few numbers, just like for the dis approximating distinct elements in a stream. So this has uh, led to this uh, direction uh, in streaming algorithms, uh, essentially designing what one can call truly sublinear space graph algorithms. That is, those that compute graph parameters without even loading the vertices of the graph into memory, let alone the edges. Okay. And uh, well, uh, our group has been instrumental in resolving quite a few challenges here. And I want to tell you about one 
uh, that I find uh, particularly exciting. So for example, this fact that you can approximate the size of a matching in a graph using, by just storing a few numbers is quite surprising because one can formally show that to approximate the uh, size of the maximum matching in a graph, you need very long range exploration. You have to be non-myopic, you have to look very deep in the graph. You have to traverse very long paths. As it turns out, however, such explorations under some assumptions on the stream can be performed ve in very short amount of, very small amount of space. Okay, so what, is the, what are the limits of this? Can one always perform long range explorations in a small amount of space? So here's a classical class of problems uh, where long range exploration is provably needed. Uh, these are NP hard pro um, constraint satisfaction problems. These are NP hard. And a classical one, the most fundamental one here is max cut. So here's a question that we re recently studied and obtained the optimal uh, bounds for. So in the max cut problem, uh, our input is a graph, uh, just looking just like the, the graph on the slide. And our task is to partition the, ver uh, the vertices of the graph into two color classes, say blue and red. And we want to maximize the number of edges going from blue to red. So here's one such solution. The green edges are cut, they go from blue to red. The black edges are not, okay? And so the question is, mm, can you find the best cut, the, the cut that cuts the largest number of edges? Uh, it is the most basic NP-hard constraint satisfaction problem, uh, the staple of the field. So what can we, what do we know about finding cuts that cut a large number of edges in graphs? Well, first, uh, there's a very basic result that just says mm, the problem is NP-hard, but I can always find a solution that, that is at least half as good. And finding the solution is very easy. You don't even look at the graph. Uh, for every vertex, you flip a coin and guess which color class it, it needs to belong to. There are two, only two options, red and blue. So with a fair coin, you'll hit the right uh, answer with probability half. So you'll get a half approximation, at least half as good. Now there's a celebrated result of Gimmons Williamson uh, that uses very geometric considerations. It basically puts the vertices of the graph onto a sphere and uses a random, uh, random hyperplane cut that gets 87% uh, of the optimal solution. So it's much better than half as good as the optimal. One is, it is also possible to uh, do better than just random coins uh, with uh, spectral techniques. So think of an eigenvalue computation, so power iteration, uh, just like in, Ma in Martin's talk. Good. And so the question is, can one implement good approximations to max cut without, using, uh, without loading the graph into memory? Is what is the streaming complexity of this problem, okay? And uh, here, there are two options. So this very simple coin flipping algorithm we can actually implement in zero space. It doesn't, look in, doesn't even look at the graph. So you can always say, I cut half of the edges, okay? So then, on the other side, one can show that if I'm able to load the vertices of the graph into memory, and maybe a little bit more than that, then I can get as close as, uh, as, close as, I, as I like to the correct answer, okay? So in zero space, you can get a half, and in, if you load the vertices into the graph, uh, of the graph into the memory, uh, you can get as close as, as, as you want. And the question is, is there anything non-trivial in between? That is, does there exist a truly sublinear space algorithm for max cut, something that approximates max cut value without loading the vertices of the graph into memory? And so we were able to prove, uh, this is joint work with uh, Dmitry Krachun, who is at the University of Geneva, that the answer here is no. Um, and this is a culmination of a sequence of uh, works, and in particular has inspired quite a line of work on general constraint satisfaction uh, problems. This is extremely fruitful. OK. So I don't have time to talk uh, at length about uh, the analysis, but I still want to tell you something. Basically here, we're dealing with an impossibility result. We want to prove that no small space algorithm can get non-trivially good answers. And so this is the main challenge in the analysis. You essentially have to rule out all possible algorithms. It's complicated. Um, the key insight that lets us 
resolve this is the idea of using Fourier analysis uh, in order to understand how much a small space algorithm knows about uh, the graph. Okay? And uh, sort of some classical techniques like the convolution theorem turn out to play a, a big role. And uh, so this idea of uh, using Fourier analysis and the convolution theorem has been fruitful for other questions as well. All right, I don't really have time to talk about the Fourier analysis part, but uh, mm, let me just mention something that ends up being at the core of this proof. In fact, finding a good uh, a cut in a graph that cuts a large number of edges can be thought of as a version of the problem of solving a linear system, where you have a variable for every vertex of the graph, and this variable gets to be 0 or 1, red or blue. And then you have constraints. For every edge, you say, OK, I want this edge to be cut. So xi plus xj needs to be 1. They have to be different. So max cut is very related to the problem of solving linear systems over the Boolean field. So here's an example of such a system. Uh, I have variables on the vertices, and every edge in my graph here at the edges uh, corresponds to a line, to, to a constraint. Okay? And if you want to sol solve max cut in the streaming model, basically the problem is that these constraints are given to you one after the other, and you don't have time to remember them. And the question is, can you get away in this situation? Or you can't, as I said. And the reason why, a good, good way of thinking about why, is the following. Uh, imagine that no, maybe you get this linear system as a homework, uh, homework exercise. And uh, maybe you do homeworks in groups of three people. Okay? And what you do then is say, OK, we don't have time. So we will partition this linear system into uh, three chunks. And every person will look at what they got and write down some very useful summary and communicate to the rest. So we'll save, uh, say, save time this way. So let's say we partition this system into red, red, blue, and uh, orange. So I just colored the edges. Okay? And uh, what we show, essentially, is that if this big system is partitioned into a number of smaller systems that are underdetermined, so if you just look at, at a, one system in isolation, you, can't, you don't know the answer. And if this partitioning is random, then there is no way to compress. So basically, the intuition is that in the first part of the stream, I'll give you a random chunk of the system which is underdetermined. You'll write down some information for me, but it, it will not be enough because you can't piece such information together. Yeah. OK, good. So this is just some intuition for how these streaming lower bound proofs go. Um, so the news here is that you can't really solve MaxCut particularly well in the streaming model. Um, you're basically at a random cut um, uh, level. <clears throat> but on the plus side, I think this should be possible. It's a very exciting direction. I think that um, uh, basically if uh, the impossibility result uh, heavily relies on the fact that you only get to look at the graph once. Uh, conjecture, which I think would be fantastic to resolve. This is, in fact, an old question of Goldreich and Rom from uh, early 2000s. Um, it should be possible, I think, to solve max cut in some sublinear amount of time without loading vertices uh, into memory uh, if you take a large number of passes over the stream, so logarithmic. Basically, this gives you time to propagate the information. Uh, good. And there are, let me not mention this, this question. All right. Good. So I told you about an impossibility result in, uh, in the streaming model that I like a lot. Let me just say a few words about a very nice algorithm that I like. Uh, positive news. So modern graphs that we have to process are large. But not only are they large, sometimes they're dynamic. They change over time. So edges come and go. People become friends, then they're not friends, and you know, uh, things change. Uh, a major direction in the streaming literature is how do we process large changing graphs, uh, graphs that are dynamic. And the only way we know how to process such graphs using small space is basically by using so-called linear algorithms. There are algorithms that think of a graph as a vector in high-dimensional space, 
And then they maintain some random projection of this graph. So that's a compact summary. So there are a lot of things that uh, one uh, is able to do uh, in this model. And in particular, recently, we have been uh, able to design such linear algorithms or sketching algorithms that approximate spectral properties of graphs well. And I will not really tell you what this means. Uh, think of linear algebraic properties. I'll just give you a small nugget, which is an algorithmic problem that emerges, that is the core of this result. It has nothing to do with streaming or sketching. It has to do with houses and wiring in houses, okay? So the question is this. Suppose that you bought a house. Okay? It's an old house, you like it a lot. You move in, um, but you're worried that the electrical wiring in the walls is old and it might overheat and cause a fire. So you don't like it. You want to update, you want to upgrade the wiring, but it's an old house. You don't have the plans and you don't know where the wires are. So you look at a wall, and here is the wall, uh, and you want to find the parts of the wiring that might overheat. So these parts are actually the wires with high effective resistance, okay? So here's a graph perspective. It's basically the following. You have some electrical network, an edge has high effective resistance. If the following is true, you come in and you hook up a battery to the two endpoints, then you measure the heat, and it heats up. These are problematic, and you want to know where they are. Okay. Good. So, as I said, uh, the house is old, and the wiring is really weird. So maybe this is the, uh, the, 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 the structure of your uh, wiring. Okay. Of course, you don't know it, so you only know the junction points. These are the vertices in the graph. All right. And you also have a battery. Now you go around, and you do these tests. You can take two, two points and hook up the battery. And you're very basic. After you hook up the battery, you just feel the wall with your hands, and you want to figure out which places heat up. Okay? And if something really heats up, you know it. You know there's a wire there, you're happy. Okay? Good. So that's your experiment. And trust me, these types of experiments you can learn with, you can do with random projections on graphs. That's how the streaming goes. Okay, so the question is: how long do you have to, you know, how many experiments do you need? You don't have all day. Uh, of course, one thing you can do is look up, look, look, try all pairs. Right? I gave you the junction points. You can do a quadratic number of tests. That takes a lot of time. We showed uh, some recently with uh, amazing PhD students at EPFL. Thanks, Jacob, for showing up. Maybe. Ah, hey. <laughs> uh, that uh, you can do this with a linear number of tests. OK? This lets you recover. Uh, approximations to graphs from these random projection style sketches um, very efficiently. I think there are a lot of things that you can do with this. Uh, you can do small space dynamic algorithms that should have applications and optimization and uh, other questions. So talk to me offline. Good. Uh, I think I still have a few minutes. Uh, or at least, ah, oh, excellent. Somewhat excellent. Mm, so in the remaining few minutes, I will talk to you a little bit about the more continuous side of things that we do. So that's around the sparse Fourier transform problem. Remember that this is inspired by medical imaging, uh, where you sort of take Fourier measurements of, uh, of an object and want to reconstruct the object. So first, what is the sparse Fourier transform problem? Um, the problem is, you're given access to some signal x. Um, and you want to find the few largest Fourier coefficients of x. Imagine that x is very big, and you're looking for a small number of Fourier coefficients. So you don't want to just do an FFT of x. You want to find the top 10 largest Fourier coefficients in time proportional to 10, not proportional to the number of elements in your vector. Okay? Uh, good. So you want to find the k largest coefficients in time roughly k. As I mentioned, this is something that uh, comes up as, as motivated by medical imaging, reconstructions in MRIs and uh, NMRs. Um, except I must say that there the setting is flipped. You're actually given access to the Fourier transform, and you want to figure out x. So it's, it's reverse. These machines take Fourier transforms. Um, this also comes up in machine learning and kernel uh, methods. Um, and uh, the problem with, uh, with this is that uh, Usually, the settings are rather high-dimensional. 
So you need to solve these problems in high dimensional settings. We have been thinking a lot about how to uh, not incur the curse of dimensionality, how to, not, uh, how to design algorithms that do not degenerate exponentially in high dimensions, and we have had uh, successes here. Um, I prefer, though, to mention some applications to fast kernel methods, okay? And uh, what are kernel methods? Kernel methods are something that is widely used in machine learning of old, so uh, machine learning of uh, 10, or Martin will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 10 or so years ago, uh, and well, actually it's still used today, as we'll see in a second. Uh, so for example, for kernel ridge regression, uh, and uh, also uh, for particle simulations in uh, physics. Okay, so this is the question of constructing good and efficient approximations to kernel matrices. That is essentially the setting is the following. We have n data points in some high dimensional space and we form a matrix, an n by n matrix, that encodes nonlinear interactions between them. For example, the Gaussian kernel matrix has uh, entries that are e to the minus distance squared between these points. So naturally this comes up in uh, particle simulations and fast multiple methods and also in uh, kernel uh, ridge regression. So, how do, we, do people generally approach such uh, problems? And so these kernel matrix, matrices have a problem in that they are very dense. The data sets are large, and it's an n by n matrix that does not have any zeros. So these are just very hard to write down. How does one uh, computationally deal with such matrices? Uh, on the machine learning side, a very popular method is something known as the Fourier features method of Rahimi and Recht, extremely popular, get, got the Test of Time Award at uh, NeurIPS 07. Uh, on the numerical analysis side, fast multiple methods are the way to go. This is a high precision uh, method for doing numerical linear algebra on kernel uh, matrices. Uh, this is from 83. Um, there was a revolution in, uh, uh, in uh, numerical simulations at the time. Unfortunately, the Fourier features method does not have guarantees for typical applications. We don't really know if it works and if it is the right thing to do. Uh, and the fast multiple methods uh, suffer from an exponential dependence on the dimension. So very recently, we have been able to, tie, uh, to get tight bounds on the number of samples that is needed for the Fourier features Rahimi, uh, method of Rahimi and Recht to solve a kernel ridge regression. Uh, and we've been able to design uh, a way of compressing kernel matrices without ever writing them down. Uh, that way, uh, we're able to avoid an exponential dependence on dimension and speed up uh, numerical linear algebra with uh, kernel matrices, okay? Good, so where can one take these uh, techniques? Uh, we have powerful tools for designing efficient approximations to kernel matrices. One can ask a number of questions that I find extremely exciting, for example, uh, in particle simulations, what happens is that one first approximates the nonlinear interactions between the points using the uh, fast multiple method, but then uses this to solve a system of uh, differential equations. See where the uh, particle goes and particles uh, go and uh, what, uh, what, what, what ends up to being the final configuration. So can one use our techniques, and our techniques basically help do kernel uh, matrix vector multiplies to get guarantees for the downstream applications. Another very exciting question is, is the following. As I mentioned, kernel matrices themselves are sort of the machine learning of, uh, old, uh, of, of years ago. However, kernel matrices are very much used in modern systems. So for example, in uh, large language models, uh, and uh, here you have uh, a schematic uh, the diagram for a, uh, for a transformer architecture. Um, attention mechanisms that uh, power large uh, language models are, are essentially a kernel uh, matrix vector multiply. So it would be fantastic to use the techniques for approximate kernel uh, matrix vector multiplication that we have to maybe speed up some of these, uh, some of these methods. Good. Um, okay, so this uh, was uh, the 
very biased sample of uh, results and directions that I find extremely exciting in sublinear algorithms. It should be clear that sublinear algorithms are this amazing field that draws from and contributes to a very diverse set of deep areas in mathematics and computer science. So you should come uh, work with us and resolve uh, major challenges in the area to achieve uh, impact. Okay, that's a thank you for listening to the, for the technical side of the talk. I'll just take one more minute because um, IC is an amazing place to be uh, for various reasons, and one of them is that you have uh, colleagues who you can turn to for advice in just about anything. Uh, and in particular, um, a good question is, what should an inaugural lecture be about? Okay, uh, so I asked, this, uh, asked colleagues uh, what the answer to this is, and the response that I got is an inaugural lecture is basically a public defense for a professor. All right, public defenses cannot proceed without pictures and acknowledgments. So uh, thank you to all the amazing PhD students and uh, postdocs uh, who, you know, without whom it would be extremely difficult to solve uh, these uh, beautiful and fundamental problems. Uh, some, of them are here, some of them are here, so thanks for showing up. Um, most importantly, uh, Pauline, uh, who is uh, my admin assistant, she's not here, because she has uh, COVID, uh, but she's the one who is uh, basically protecting me from complete administrative chaos. I, uh, it would be very difficult to do anything without her. And uh, finally, uh, many thanks to uh, my amazing wife. Uh, here she is. Oh, the picture is really private. It's excellent. Uh, okay, uh, so here she is, uh, the mother of dragons, and the dragons are not pictured on the picture. Uh, thanks for, to them as well for providing the chaos. All right, good. Thanks a lot.